we are absolutely honored to have with us to answer a lot of common questions uh, so we can just get the latest information. Uh, Dr. Amy Mathers, she is an associate professor of medicine and pathology and associate director of clinical microbiology and the medical director for antimicrobial stewardship. We can say all of that fast. But at the end of the day, um, uh, Dr. Mathers, we are just we're we feel so blessed to be able to talk with you this morning. Good morning to you. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we, you know, my colleague and I were talking about you know you hear terms like genome and testing and proteins and spike proteins, and it's enough to like you can pull your hair out, you know, trying yeah. to figure it all out. So we wanted to start with the basics, Dr. Mathers. So. You know, people are really, you know, when they start to get symptoms or, you know, they're around people, they want to get tested. And you guys, you you definitely specialize in that area. Can you help us understand the difference? We hear the term rapid or antigen test and, and a we hear the term, the acronym PCR. Is there is there a significant difference between the two? Yeah, and um, you, you sort of started off with the science lesson there with all the different components of a virus or of, of you know, the building blocks of life. So the, the antigen test or the rapid antigen test or what is um, coming to people's, you know, homes through the, the government program um, to distribute home tests is antigen testing. And so that's looking for the, the proteins that the virus makes. Um, and so that's somewhat of an indication that there's, you know, active virus sitting in your nose um, or throat, depending on where you, you obtain the specimen. And so then that test goes on to a little strip typically that um, uses color or a color system to if the, the protein's there, you see the color. If it's not there, it's, you know, no color strip lights up. Um, presuming the test was all done well and the, and the controls worked. Um, it's, it's a lot like, and it looks to people like a pregnancy test, if you've ever had a home pregnancy test. Mm. The PCR test is a little more complicated, um, and that's why it's pretty much done in a lab, and that's why most people don't put the word rapid in front of it, because um, it's, it takes a little while longer and it takes some sophisticated lab chemicals and processes to get that. And what, what the PCR is looking for is a different part of the viral particle, so the RNA or the, the instruction booklet for the virus um, to replicate. And so this, the thing about the PCR and what makes it slightly more sensitive is if, even if you have just one or two strands of RNA, theoretically that will, because it goes through cycles and you multiply um, with each cycle that the test goes through, um, usually about 45 cycles, it will multiply each strand of, of RNA, meaning like if you started with one strand of viral RNA, the next cycle you'd have two, and then the next cycle you'd have four, and then 16, and so on. And so theoretically, it's not just theoretically, it is more sensitive than the um, antigen test that's looking for the protein. Um, yeah. because you have to have enough protein for it to be detected by that color, mm. you know, by the antibodies that light up the color strip. Doc, Dr. Amy Mathers is with us. Doctor, thank you. That That is definitely helpful. And so the, the next, you know, natural progression of that conversation is people want to know, you know, what can they depend on? And that's a hard question. I know, You know what I mean? Before I phrase it to you, I feel bad even asking you that. But I know that people are saying, so is, is the rapid test dependable? Is Is it true that the the PCR is more dependable or is it or more accepted by the medical community as being more accurate? Yeah, and you know, I think I think it's a good question, Jay. What can you really depend on? And, you know, for fortunately or unfortunately, the pandemic has really put people in the driver's seats of some of these decisions that were pretty much made by physicians and in, in conjunction with a physician's office prior to this. But now we've got home tests coming to your home to do your own viral testing. So you, so you as the, the consumer, needs to sort of get engaged in how the test works. Um, and so first and foremost, you know, depend on yourself um, in, in some ways. If you have symptoms and you were exposed to somebody with COVID, even if that test comes up negative, 
if you were my patient or you at home, you're like, I'm pretty sure I have COVID because I've got all the symptoms and my test is coming up negative. The home test is not as sensitive or, another way to put it, reliable um, as the PCR test is. And for work and for transmission reasons, it's really good to know if you are infected with SARS-CoV-2 for, for a whole host of reasons. Mm-hmm. And so if, if you have enough um, reason to believe that you actually have COVID, you probably should go and get the more sensitive test if the home test comes back negative. If you have all those symptoms, though, and the home test comes back positive and you know you were exposed to COVID, you have COVID and you probably actually don't even need to bother going and getting a PCR test. Um, However, the reverse is true. If you're just taking a test every day (laughs) um, and you don't really have any reason, you haven't left your house since 2020 and, and all those things, and it comes up positive and you don't have any symptoms, hmm, you know, something might not be working quite right. And so they are very reliable, and, and the positive result is pretty reliable right now because there's so much COVID circulating or SARS-CoV-2 circulating in our community. And so a positive test should be regarded as positive. But a negative test in the right context um, probably needs to be followed up. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Dr. Amy Mathers with uh, the University of Virginia Health System. We're talking about COVID testing. All of us talk about it, access to testing. When I hear that explanation from you, Dr. Mathers, and I'm just sometimes I can be simple and and it just gives me more peace of mind when a medical professional is administering the test versus myself. Right. You know, did I did I squeeze the specimen right? Did I do enough swap? You know what I mean? We're untrained. But I get what you're saying in terms of if it's positive in the home test, would it be would it be uh, easier, I guess, to surmise it and say, you know it's positive if the home test, because it's it in order for the home test to be positive, it, the load has to be so strong. Where you were talking about the sensitivity of the PCR, so it, it, I guess as we circle back, so that people are really kind of sure about this, a positive home test is a really really good chance that they're that the person is positive. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say, but you you sort of explained it even better, Jay, because. If you don't follow the instructions exactly right, I mean, these tests, again, were designed to be done by medical professionals and by trained personnel, and now you're doing it in your home. And so um, just make sure that you follow the exact instructions. For example, there's, there's data to show that if you run that test when it's too cold, like let's say you ran it outside in, in the car this morning, that test actually is more likely to give you a false positive. So you really, really need to pay attention to the exact instructions, just like a recipe, I say follow it all the way through. If you did all of that and you did a home test and you got a positive, especially in the context of how much COVID circulating in our community right now, it means it's positive, most, you know, mm-hmm. if you did everything right. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Dr. Amy Mathers is helping us break this down. I know your office gets deluged with questions, and we thank you for taking some time uh, on a very, very, uh, you know, it's it's a compelling, it's the issue of our time right now. Everybody just trying to see, and and it's motivated from a good place. Everybody wants to be safe. They want their kids safe. They want, you know, their coworkers um, to be safe. I, I, as of one last follow-up on this, Dr. Uh, Amy Mathers is with us, University of Virginia. Um it, should I guess I get what we're when we're taking these home tests and you said they're designed for medical professionals. Do you has there ever been discussion amongst you and your colleagues about like I've always wondered this like why are we using two different types? I don't see that a lot in and I could be wrong in in other tests for other disorders and diseases that are communicable. There's usually like one. I don't want to make a broad statement as an untrained professional where I'm going with this, but. It seems to me that there's typically for other communicable diseases we're more familiar with that's not a novel virus. We don't have a couple of different, uh, you know, sensitivity tests. Do, is it is it a good is it a fair question to say why are we using two different types of tests? Yeah, it is a fair question, but I actually would would counter that. Actually, we we do do this with a lot of different infectious diseases. So, for example, influenza. There is an antigen test that doctors have done in their offices that is known to be not as sensitive 
Um, it's known by medical professionals, but again, in the right context of symptoms, much like what we're doing with the antigen test for COVID, you get tested with the antigen test in the office, it comes up positive for flu, you had a fever, you have a cough, your doctor says, we're done here, we're not even going to send it. But if it comes up negative, they'll actually send it off to the lab for a PCR. The same is true of strep throat. You ever heard of that strep screen where they tell you right in the office, oh, you have strep throat, but actually here at UVA, if that comes up negative and you have a very bad sore throat with, um, that looks consistent with a strep throat, they send it to our lab and we set up a culture and do a, a more sensitive test um, that takes a couple more days. Hmm. And yeah. so the, it's not unusual to have sort of a screening test followed by a more sensitive um, test that sort of doesn't miss any of the cases. You know, and the last thing on this, Dr. Mathers, it seems like, I I mean, we're all, it's exciting because we're learning, you know, as we're in two years into this, we're learning so much more than we did in March of 2020, obviously. And and your research is right there uh, at the forefront. Is it, it sounds to me like it's just so key that people pay attention to their symptoms. You know, is, is, would that be fair to say? Yes, and I mean, unfortunately, with COVID, and I think that's the thing that's made it so, the pandemic so challenging, is some people just don't have symptoms. Um, But if you have symptoms in the right context, that makes it so much more likely that you actually have a COVID-19 infection. Hmm. And so that is part of the puzzle. You know, as as an infectious disease physician, I'm always thinking, okay, I've got all these tests, but I've got these symptoms, and I've got... And I'm putting together the puzzle. And I agree with you that pretty much every American that's been paying attention for the last two years has sort of a minor in infectious disease and diagnostics and has had to be sort of trained in a lot of these things. Um, so Yeah, it, it is. I tell you, Dr. Mathers, we're so grateful for your time this morning because it. I really do. You frame this well and it gives folks to, a chance to go back and listen to it and kind of have a strategy for them and their family based on their symptoms who they've been around, you know, it's, yep. it, it's just, you know, like a lot of you medical professionals say, I don't mean to say you people, but as <laughs> you medical professionals say, <laughs> you just got to take all the information, right? You got to pull, pull all the information, you know, and I, it reminds me of how doctors like yourself will ask a series of questions. Who have you been around? Have you done this? Have you done that? Are you experiencing that? And then they take the pieces of that puzzle. So in some ways, Dr. Mathers, final question, as new as this is, are there still some ways that common medical practice around infectious disease can still be helpful with COVID? Yeah, and I mean, I think we touched on them just sort of, you know, sort of assessing your risk for, you know, disease X, um, you know, is, is something that we do day in and day out. And then I think all the things for a respiratory virus that we've also learned and learned well, you know, the things that work, vaccines work, masks work, um, you know, to prevent transmission and, and all of those, um, you know, things that have been challenging and hard for us all to do, but, um, you know, they work. Yeah, yeah, and then the last, the, this is your, your parting shot, Dr. Mathers, is, and we're so grateful for your time. You know, I, I think all of us, uh, it's a universal thing, hope, right? You know, we, mm-hmm. we're all tired. Do yeah. you seeing this at the at the genome level, at the protein level, the things that you understand that are far beyond the the average person? Do you have hope that we we may not be at the finish line, but do you see light at the end of the tunnel? I do. I mean, I think that when I look at you know just the virus itself, it is a novel virus like we've never seen before. You know, it is it no virus like this has has impacted. Um, humanity ever before. And so, you know, we're two years into this, which seems like a very short period of time, but I think we're seeing it's it's settling out. And I am very hopeful that the next six months will look different than the last two years. I love it. That's how we'll end it. Dr. Amy Mathers, whew, we are so <laughs> grateful. This has been, it, it's, I know for me, I don't know about the listener, I, I learned something. So uh, uh, I, well, I really appreciate it. Hey? Yeah. Well, you keep up the wonderful work over there. And again, we, we hope to have an opportunity to talk with you in the future. But thank you so much. Thank you. Have All a right. great day. You too. Bye bye. That is Dr. Amy Mathers.